Hello YouTube, Dave here again. Uh, today I'm going to be doing my final thoughts on Xanathar's Guide to Everything. So over the course of about the last week or so, uh, I've put out a total of six videos including my first impressions, uh, which came out a few days prior to me discussing all the classes and the encounter building options. There are other bits of information in this book, but uh, honestly I kind of want to uh, essentially move on and just go right into my, my final review, my final thoughts on this book. Uh, so, uh, in my initial impressions, I had said that I consider this to be the best of the supplements released so far for 5th uh, edition Dungeons & Dragons. And I still believe that. Um, now, the main thing to, to really kind of take away with that is Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide is more of a regional uh, information book that has some player options than a new player's options book. Volo's Guide to Monsters is similarly a monster book. This is the first real supplement that is designed to uh, add tons of new options for player characters, and it does that relatively well. Uh, overall, there are some of the class options that are in here that just never really um, sat well with me or thrilled me. Uh, the ones that really stood out, in my opinion, would have to be uh, the... Uh, I actually ended up liking the Path of the Zealot, even if I thought one of the abilities was a bit powerful. Uh, I also like the College of Whispers for the Bards. Uh, the Forge and Grave Domains I both thought were great. Um, I liked the Circle of the Shepherd, wasn't so keen on Circle of Dreams for the Druid. Uh, the Fighter I liked the Arcane Archer a lot, uh, as well as the Cavalier was pretty decent, and the Samurai was, was alright as well. Uh, was not a fan of the Drunken Master, but that's for my own personal uh, opinions and not so much how it was presented in the book. As presented in the book, the Drunken Master is actually not that bad. Uh, the Way of the Kensai was actually a pretty enjoyable uh, monk option for me, who's somebody who doesn't really like monks at all. So that one almost made me kind of interested, and if I played a monk, I think that's the one that I would likely end up going with. Uh, the Way of the Sun Soul was interesting as well, but I wasn't, again, personally too keen on that. For Paladins, um, I liked the Oath of Redemption quite a bit, uh, and I like Oath of Conquest as a dungeon master for use in designing an interesting villain, more so than what I would want my player characters to have. Uh, for the Ranger, I was surprisingly only really happy with the Monster Slayer. Uh, the Gloomstalker was alright, uh, but it would have to be in a campaign that kind of addresses that character's abilities. Now, if you're playing Out of the Abyss, for example, uh, the campaign path, then the Gloomstalker would be an amazing addition. Otherwise, it's not necessarily my favorite uh, of the three Ranger abilities. Uh, I enjoyed the, the Inquisitive, uh, the Rogue Path. Mastermind was interesting and, and all right, and I also liked the Scout and the, and the Swashbuckler, so overall I was pretty happy with the Rogue options. Uh, Sorcerer, I really enjoyed the Divine Soul and the Shadow Magic uh, Sorcerer's Origins. And wasn't as keen. Whoops, on storm, uh, on the storm magic. And then finally for the warlock, the celestial and hexblade were both uh, excellent additions to the uh, the warlock class. And I loved the war mage uh, options for the player characters. So overall, initially I was really ho hum about most of the options in here for the characters. There was only a couple that I was actually looking forward to, which was the Monster Slayer and the Arcane Archer with along with the War Mage. So I'm glad that I actually took the time to make those videos because it really made me read the abilities and actually kind of uh, come to appreciate a lot of the things that were designed in this book. Not saying that I would use all of them and there are some that I would probably Probably never touch but again the options that were introduced were quite good and if you're interested in uh, learning more about any of these in particular uh, you can consult the uh, the playlist that I have uh, I broke them down sort of into uh, primal characters um, martial divine and arcane uh, type of character class archetypes uh, so from that, uh, that's you know the, the new class abilities. Now, uh, my opinions on most of the rest of the stuff in the book really hasn't changed. I love the background information, uh, the ability to create um, sort of more fleshed out backgrounds just based on some charts. And I'll be honest, I would love to just roll one out randomly. And that's something that I might actually do, uh, is create a brand new character using one of the uh, options presented in this book 
and use the background information contained uh, therein because I think that would be really really cool to do just to go through and explain you know what your upbringing was like why you're in the background that you're in and why you're in the class that you're in so that information really hasn't uh, changed all that much uh, as far as the racial feats go uh, I didn't really talk about them too much um, if you want me to do a video on the racial feats I certainly can uh, I consider these to be nice little bonuses but it's probably something that I personally would likely rarely use. I mean, if I played a drow, I might give them the drow high magic, because I think that would be kind of cool. Uh, as well as elven accuracy, which is another one that I uh, liked as well. But beyond that, I don't know how many of these I would ever end up using. Most because I'm just not huge on feats anymore anyway. I kind of got burnt out on them when it came to 3rd uh, edition Dungeons and Dragons. Um, another great, excellent addition that I had mentioned in my initial thoughts, so I'm not going to dwell on it too much here, is just the information on the toolkits and uh, things like, you know, why you would want to use them and what skills you can combine them with to give you advantage on the rolls to learn information. So this section here, the tool proficiencies, is something that really, really, really is a major addition uh, to this that I absolutely a door. Um, the same kind of goes for the downtime activity which I think comes a little bit later uh, so I'll touch on that in a moment. Now when it comes to the encounter building this was the section that I was the most interested to read as a dungeon master uh, mainly because <clears throat> earlier I had designed an encounter on video uh, using <clears throat> the steps laid out in the fifth edition DMG and while that was more of a informative tutorial type of video, uh, <clears throat> my actual thoughts were that I wasn't really happy with some of the extra steps, like the encounter multipliers and things of that nature. So I was really interested to see what this had to offer. And uh, overall, this is sort of a simpler version of encounter creation. Uh, but the one thing is, is that it does present it in probably the most uh, initially confusing way possible. Uh, and it just doesn't really lay out like their charts the way that I really would have liked. Um, for example, you know, challenge rating, uh, like, you know, per character or something, uh, would have been, would have been a little bit better just because that's the way that it's meant to be. Uh, so that's a section that I would probably honestly stick to the actual Dungeon Master's Guide version, uh, myself when designing encounters. Another interesting thing is that a lot of their encounter rules, uh, don't really apply to their encounter charts. Uh, a lot of their encounter charts can create situations where you're just not going to be able to... Um, it, it goes beyond just the uh, standard, easy, and sort of hard encounters. For example, uh, the Orc Eye of Grummish. So I created an Orc Eye of Grummish with uh, two Orcs as a hard encounter for a group of third level characters. Now this is an encounter chart of level 1 through 4, but it's one Eye of Grummish and two D8 Orcs. So you could potentially roll pretty high. I mean, that's up to 16 additional Orcs for characters level 1 through 4. It just seems a bit too much. I mean, I think it would have been better to have an Eye of Grummish plus one D3 Orcs, uh, myself personally. So it is interesting that their encounter charts, while they are incredibly useful, uh, their encounter charts don't necessarily stick to their own uh, design guidelines for uh, easy, medium, and hard encounters. So that's just one thing to, to keep note of. And it does mention it in here that, you know, you can roll the high groups and the player characters will hopefully, you know, be smart enough not to rush in headlong. But still, just the same, you know, it would be nice if the encounter level charts would have been uh, a little bit more in line with what their actual guidelines are. Uh, as outlined by uh, the steps earlier uh, before these charts uh, came in the book. Now, uh, other than that though, I, I would still end up using a lot of these encounter charts because they are still, you know, useful, uh, especially for doing stuff randomly. Now, I never really got into the, uh, the traps and I haven't really spent a lot of time uh, with the traps just because I don't really use a lot of traps in my games and the, one of the reasons for that is, is that seldom do players actually end up playing rogues? Uh, it happens so infrequently that I don't really like to put traps in because I don't want to penalize the players for playing the characters that they want and that they would enjoy. So, uh, I mean, it's, the information seems interesting. I do like, you know, just sort of the uh, 
section here with the trap save DCs and the attack bonuses. So it's just some, you know, if you want to make something sort of quick and easy, then you can certainly do that here. And that's one of the things that uh, I like about it quite a bit. And this is probably what I would end up using more than anything else, is just the uh, these few charts here. But this does go into some great information about things like disarming traps, um, you know, how to make traps, uh, placing them, uh, as well as, you know, having simple and complex traps. But again, I don't have enough people play rogues in my games that I want to use traps too often. So that's something that I don't get to use an awful lot. Uh, the downtime, again, was an excellent addition. It just kind of fills out some more things. And I like the idea of having some situations that can become complicated. Um, and that, you know, the addition of things like a rival can make it even more difficult to achieve certain things. Uh, one of my favorite additions overall to the uh, downtime activity has to be, if I can find it here, uh, the gambling section. So it actually gives you sort of some ideas on what to do, what checks to make, how to resolve it, because uh, before it was just sort of uh, a straight dice uh, die roll that I would use um, against certain DCs or opposed checks or things like that. Uh, so this does it a lot better actually, and I like this uh, quite a bit, and it gives you some great guidelines on how to, uh, how to deal with people that want to gamble in their downtime. So the downtime activities is fantastic, uh, as well as I believe the next section is on uh, magic items and this is another very important section uh, in my opinion and one of my favorite things that they did uh, as I mentioned before was the creation of some common magic items which have very very minor abilities but it's still something that can allow you to give out magical items earlier on in the game uh, for example a lot of times it seems like the magic items that actually are permanent like weapons swords or some of the more miscellaneous items you don't really seem to get a whole lot of um, during your earlier levels. It just seems like most of like up until like fifth level or so you're still using for the most part just regular items and maybe one player in the group may have an actual magical weapon. So just having things like this um, just really cool. Uh, again just, they're all minor stuff but they're just cool little items uh, like cloth of mending uh, that you know pieces uh, actually you know repair itself like it, it it stitches itself back together if it gets torn up. Uh, you know, things like that. I still think the Hat of Wizardry is probably my favorite, where you can try to use a cantrip that you don't already know, but you have to make an intelligence check in order to do so. So these are just great little minor things that you can add uh, to your, especially to your lower level uh, uh, adventures. So you can actually have your, you know, first, second, and third level characters get some some nice items and of course the charts uh, for magic items based off of rarity you know minor and major and then as common uncommon rare very rare and legendary is just again really super useful information as well and of course the new spells uh, new spells are always you know a, a good welcome addition uh, to the game so um, and then following up just with the uh, with the names and again the names are always my favorite things of any of these books because I'm so so terrible uh, so terrible with coming up with names so overall uh, this is an excellent book and um, I will say I was initially not as happy with it uh, as I am now upon kind of reading through it and spending a little bit more time with it so I'm glad that I did that uh, this is an excellent book um, if you are a player and you want to have some more options beyond what's just in the player's handbook, then this is the book to get. Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide just doesn't have enough unless you really specifically want something like um, like the Elven uh, Bladesinger, I think, is in, is in that book. But otherwise, uh, this is an excellent addition uh, to your collection. And I think uh, for Dungeon Masters, there's also a lot of really great stuff in here as well. Some new magic items. And if you're, you know, not as um, comfortable with the encounter creation steps that are in the Dungeon Master's Guide, then once you wrap your head around it, once you kind of figure out how to do things, then the uh, encounter building in this book is probably a good you know way to go. Uh, it's not the one that I personally choose. In fact, I'll be honest, uh, I just kind of design encounters based off of my own instincts and intuition, but that's as somebody that has nearly 20 years of designing encounters uh, under their belt. So in conclusion, uh, excellent book, well worth the purchase if you can pick it up. 
Uh, and I think there's just something in here for everyone. And I think anyone who picks this up is going to find something that they like. So of all the 5th uh, the edition books that have come out aside from the core books, um, this is the one that I would recommend the most as probably the next purchase. Um, so again, I love this book quite a bit. Um, now again, for Dungeon Masters, you may want to consider Volo's Guide to Monsters first. But this is an excellent, excellent book and well worth having in your collection. So I can't recommend this enough. Anyway, if you guys have any questions about uh, anything contained in this book, please let me know. Uh, I look forward to reading your comments and I try to answer as many questions as I possibly can. So thank you guys very much for watching. Let me know what you think of Xanathar's Guide. I know it's been out for a little while and we'll see you next time.